I'd like to talk about why I'm actually working on FPGAs at the moment and what I'm doing on FPGAs. I started off in electronics quite a long time ago, probably 20, 25 years ago. But in all that time, I hadn't really used FPGAs. So let me tell you a little bit of a story about how I got there. Um, you probably recognise some of these people. Certainly the two on the left. Some of you may recognise the person on the right as well. We'll say more about him in a little bit. Um, I'm going to talk about why I'm working on FPGA. So here's me and some of my friends. It's my friends that need the FPGAs, not me. I'm a lad. But it will help me communicate with them. And this is something we're seeing a lot. This is somebody's idea, a company's idea of the future in terms of very high requirements in terms of getting information in and out of silicon, processing that information um, via FPGAs, etc. So for me, it all started in my childhood with one of these. I don't know if anyone recognises those things. I see Ken is smiling. Uh, probably had something similar, um, which sparked my interest. Got me through a few different magazines, working my way up to different kinds of publishing. Uh, and I would make things. Didn't always work. Mostly didn't work, in fact, but actually got me going. Then, one day, I, I got one of these. And this sent me off on a bit of a tangent. Um, it led me on to how these things come together, how they work, how to use them. You probably see some numbers there, you know. 6809, one of my favourites. Z80, of course. Uh, 6502. Which meant I had to understand this. Anyone know what this is? This is a Van Neumann architecture on which pretty much everything I've been writing software on, whether that's assembly or code, for the last 30 years. Because of him, of course. Uh, so I had to learn all this stuff. Uh, when I first learnt this, we didn't have much in terms of computer to run on. We were inputting in things like hex pads and all sorts of strange devices. And we did a lot, you know, in workbooks and notebooks and things like that. And we'd have to talk through our programmes. Because we couldn't always get access to a computer to actually run them. Um, you had things like this. This was quite a luxury in those days where you could actually put your program in, although you had to convert it to hex in order to do so. Then later you got things like printouts of your program, so you could record them and eventually, I think this is from an Apple, uh, you could actually manipulate these on screen and start running them interactively. But I was still also working with these. At the end of the day, my interest was primarily electronics and not computers. But when I went to university, um, I came across something that this guy did in 1957. Anyone know what that is, a perceptron? So this was um, some work he did when he was looking at how the brain worked. He was looking at neurons. And this is his model, his generic model of... Uh, a basic neuron. And then I read this book whilst I was at university, which really interested me, which was about the concepts of parallel distributed processing, rather than having a sequential type system for processing things. This examined all sorts of things, from perceptrons to linear algebra to all sorts of different matrix manipulations. And that got me thinking, you know, could you combine these two things? How would you go about creating something that could do what perceptrons and neural nets could do, you know, with logic, etc.? However, the 68,000 happened, which took my attention. This occurred. I don't know if any of you remember this. This was the very first Macintosh. I actually got a chance to use one of these. They weren't really used commercially. They were used for companies prior to the Mac Plus from Apple. And I do things like this, write Pascal, because uh, we had to learn Pascal rather than C. 
uh, at university, which was a bit disappointing to me. So that took me away from that. And then 8086 happened, you know, followed by several generations, 186, 286, pre 86 SX in this case. And uh, this actually came with a co processor, a floating point co processor as an option, which was good because the stuff I was working on required a floating point. So I actually started implementing some of this, uh, in this case, I think it's Turbo C on a 55SX. But again, it was fairly rubbish because the amount of memory involved at the time, the processing power was still nowhere enough to get anywhere beyond you know, early research on these things. Then we had an AI winter, that's meant to be snow by the way, I couldn't find a picture for that, uh, where ev nobody was into parallel distributed processing, uh, nobody wanted to talk about artificial intelligence, etc, etc. And then this happened, uh, a lovely early version of Windows, which got me involved in working on these sorts of things, graphics cards, working with graphics cards, manufacturing graphics cards, drivers, designing hardware, etc. In the early days, ISA bus, EISA, micro architectures, and later PCI, etc., etc. Also, new bus and things like that on the Mac. Um, meanwhile, the internet happened with lots and lots of racks of computers, cabling, Ethernet, etc. And because the clock speed ramp ran out, I moved into working with things like Pi Calculus and Lambda Calculus, etc., dealing with concurrent processing. And these grew and grew. Um, the example here is, um, on the right hand side, is a dual core Intel processor. I lost count now, I think we're up to 22 in a core on a Xeon. You can buy at the moment. There is the Adaptiva Epiphany, which has 16 cores, was also going to be available in a 64 core version. But we're seeing cores, 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 and more cores. And that got me back into using concurrent processing in embedded systems um, and real-time systems. Um, we've got the Epiphany on the right-hand side there on the Parallela board, which some of you may be aware of. Um, down below, I've snuck that one in. I haven't ever built one of these, but uh, that's a transputer board at the bottom there. Um, some of you who may know David May. David May started a company called Exmos, and uh, I, I do a lot of work on Exmos stuff in embedded hardware, multi-core, real-time work, etc. Meanwhile, because of the internet and the perceptron, this has made a real comeback. Um, people like Facebook, Google, Twitter, IBM, Microsoft, anyone that's big in data, big in the cloud, is now spending enormous amounts of money on research, poaching various different famous people from the AI markets uh, that have worked on neural networks, convolution networks, perceptrons, etc. And they've had a great deal of success in working with things like images, so facial recognition, picking out patterns, buying patterns, for example, uh, on Amazon, etc. So this, this new load on, on the cloud, if you like, is, is taking up many, many cycles. It's actually overtaking the traditional loads that are running on, on the cloud servers. Um, Remember these graphics cards? Well, these had very specific graphics engines in them that weren't particularly von Neumann-like, but were designed to move uh, information about very quickly and do very simple tasks repeatedly on the same information, whether that's graphics, textures, etc. Well, these things grew up into this. This is the NVIDIA Titan, which was up until recently the, the card that you put in your workstation 
or you would put several of these in a workstation, PCI slots allowing, which would enable you to accelerate your machine learning algorithms. Um, these literally have, you know, thousands of GPU processors, floating point processor units in them, as well as onboard memory. That then led to this. This is the inside of NVIDIA's latest release, which is the Pascal. And this has literally tens of thousands of pro GPU processing units. It really is a monster. Um, but unfortunately, even though these are very powerful and good for crunching things like machine learning, simulating neural networks, simulating convolution networks, and all these complex matrix type uh, calculations, they use a lot of power. So they're being used um, in training, for example, because when you are doing machine learning, you will need to run through the network with different examples and teach the network how to do different things. So actually reacting in the network takes a certain amount of processing. Training will take thousands, hundreds of thousands times more processing because you have to run through the examples of it. So these are often used to accelerate that process. But we are all really still dancing to the Van Neumann tune. We're still running these on Van Neumann architectures. And although this is a very good architecture in a generic sense, it is a very slow way of calculating things like perceptrons. Um, you really are trying to use a sledgehammer when you just need something to tap it which took me back to this recently. I'm realising that in order to make these devices more accessible, this is an open source um, robot arm, for example. In order to get machine learning into something like this and have it smart enough to do closed loop feedback, etc., to make it useful, then without needing one of these to do the processing in order to train it, without the power envelope of multiple graphics cards going into the system, then we're going to need something different. So we say goodbye to Mr. Newman, and we say hello again to Mr. Turing this time. It's back to basics in terms of what we're going to process. We're going to reshuffle the pack here, move John down and it changes the game. Here is the kind of, if you like, the Van Neumann curve, and this is the other curve that is starting to emerge. And what you're seeing is um, a lot of technology emerging at the bottom here on the second S-curve, and you're seeing a lot of hybrid, hybridization and combinations on the top. Now that hybridization is coming in different, different forms. One of it is GPUs, which is the kind of souped up <coughs> Van Neumann, but also you've got very long word instructions, SIMD instructions, vector-based instructions that are being added into cores in order to speed up the numerical performance of the devices. <coughs> You're also getting some clever things happening, such as additional tiny processors that are being added onto the side of the actual full-blown processors themselves as well but you're still getting problems with the memory because of the memory architecture of the von Neumann machines. So what we're actually seeing is that memory starting to be broken up in different ways to en enable concurrent access to it, to process large matrices of information. Um, and there are some companies already down there on the new S-curve that have literally gone nearly all of the way. People like IBM are building completely new chips that look nothing like a von Neumann machine. And they're applying these to very specific uh, neuromorphic applications. Part of that is to do with research. They've got money from DARPA in order to build uh, or simulate a human brain over the next 10 years. In order to do that, they've got to get down to picojoules per perceptron. And if you try and simulate a perceptron on a normal processor, it's not picojoules, it's watts. So in order to simulate a trillion neurons, then you're going to need you know, literally tiny amounts of power processing on each, each neuron and its connections. And in fact, it's sometimes it's the connections that are using the power, not the processing. It's the movement of the data. 
which means you need new building blocks. Here I've got perceptrons, things like fast Fourier transforms, convolutions, image convolutions. And new tools here is just a simple example in Verilog. It's one of the tools we already have to hand, bringing me to what I actually need to talk about, which is the FPGAs. Um, I want to talk about a project that is an open source project by a chap called Clifford Wolf. That's his avatar, by the way. He doesn't really look like that, although it's quite similar. Um, he's done a board that fits on the Raspberry Pi, which you can see on the left there, that has some PMOD ports, that has the lattice chip on it that I'm going to talk about. Uh, and there's his a picture of uh, a CAD file from that. Um, he has created a complete open source stack for uh, that currently targets the Lattice chipset, but it's actually an open stack. You can target a number of different FPGA chips for it. YOSIS, which is one of those recurring acronyms, is um, basically the thing that produces the HDL. Um, Project Ice Storm is really just about um, re-engineering the Lattice bitstream. There's enough information that they provide that he could do this, and he's very good at doing this sort of thing. Um, Arachne is really the place and root part of that that does the optimization and also produces the output files ready for moving up to the, um, to the chip itself. So the three of these together form this tool that enable you to pre-program FPGAs using completely open source software on Linux or Mac OS. I eventually will imagine it gets ported to Windows as well. Um, but not in its native form. It might need SigWin or something similar. Um, so why Yosis? Well, because it's open source. For me, I wanted to learn Verilog and I wanted to understand what's going on. I didn't want to download 100, 200, 1,000 gigabytes or whatever it takes to install the Xilinx tools, etc. I don't know how much this software is, but probably less than 100 megabytes, I should imagine, all in all. It's very small. Um, depends on the dependencies, etc. So it, um, it's expandable by different people. People are already working on it at different levels. Uh, it's extensible, so it's not specifically tied into Lattice, although he, ta he targeted Lattice to start with. Um, and it's very small, and it's actually pretty fast and you can get stuff done really quickly. And the way I like to work is with a basic editor and a command line, just sending the stuff backwards and forwards to uh, the development board. Um, Yosis was created to support these um, small FPGAs initially. In this case, the lattice ones that we're talking about, the ICE range, the ICE 40 range, come in about 1,000 1, to 8,000 logical units, you know, they're not huge FPGAs, but you can still do some fairly useful stuff with them. They do have some nice features like low voltage differential signaling to get information in and out quickly if you need to do that, with cameras, etc., that kind of thing, um, or high speed ADCs. They're actually low power as well, so you can actually run these off batteries. They've actually been designed to be low power FPGAs from the start which makes them actually applicable in, in the market space for a low power device. Um, in terms of packaging, obviously CSP, which is a new thing, BGA, a bit fiddly if you're doing it yourself, but they do have QFP packages. So for example, the 4K, 4,000 gate version, sorry, 4,000 logical unit version comes in a QFP 144 package, so you can actually solder these as well, which is quite nice. Uh, you only have to go up to the BGA for the 8,000 uh, lookup table version. And they're low cost. They're about $5 to $10. It's not a lot of money. Anyone that's looked at FPGAs will probably know that they start at silly prices and move quickly on to ridiculous amounts of money. So they're very good to actually start with. Um, what would you make with something like this? Well, something that's popular is things like vintage games, consoles and emulation. Uh, not really my bag, but a lot of people do that. Um, driving LED arrays is very popular with this sort of stuff. Video and graphics generation, whether that just be, you know, creating screens, 
making basic games or doing things like you know um, color backgrounds for TVs and things like that to uh, create different color rooms etc that kind of thing complex multi-channel audio processing again that's not particularly different difficult in FPGA mostly numerical manipulation of fast streams of data I2S or something similar um, you can also use it for doing uh, image processing uh, sorry voice processing so if you have multiple arrays of microphones and you want to focus in on different people in a room for example that can be done using I2S streams uh, real-time digital signal processing and ADC anything that you need to do mathematically fast with your real-time data your ADC data um, in terms of putting soft cores on there it's fairly easy there's a PICO risk example that Clifford has put on there which is about less than 1200 lookup tables so if you've got the 8000 you've still got plenty left to play with um, and there are lots of different ones there he's ported something like 15 different ones and had them running through Yosis and on, on the lattice chips um, or you could model a 300 neuron worm uh, or I can because I'm actually working on doing that at the moment purely because the information is there I have the, I have the uh, map of the worm and its neurons and I can simulate it just about in an 8000 uh, okay, probably less when I optimise it so I'm going to do it anyhow because it's fun along the bottom here there's a small board there which is about £13 from Farnell that you can run Yosis with if you can get the damn things I will add that they're always on back order at the moment. There's a large one which is the 8K one, which is one I used. I got that from Mouse, so that was about £26. Uh, there's Clifford's board. I don't know how much she was charging for that. That was about €90, Euros, but it was just a one off he did. Um, there are some other boards that his tools run on as well. There's some Kickstarter projects and there's some other boards out there. Um, it's not just Lattice that this is being targeted at. So far, uh, has anyone heard of the Saligo Green Packs? These are the tiniest FPGAs ever. I mean, they are, they're like an 0402. They are really, really tiny. They have like 18 legs on them and they're great for doing glue logic. They're almost like a CPLD, but they're actually mixed signals. So they have ADCs in them and some lookup tables and logic units, etc. Some of them have DAX as well, some of them have I2C, some of them have SPI. They're really useful in places where I used to use like an ADR Tiny, I tend to use these. Um, well, somebody's ported Yosis to support these devices now, so you, you can actually use Yosis to do your Verilog. Now, if you look, they have a really nice tool, but it's schematic based. Uh, and it gets really complicated if you've got a complicated set of logic. It's very difficult to follow, so doing it in Verilog makes that a lot lot easier so that's going to be really useful you can also target uh, Zilink Series 7 as well although I haven't done any of that it is possible okay so it's not just confined to those lattice chip people are already porting it to different devices etc and building on his tools um, it's got a very modern Verilog support um, I was very shocked when I started using Verilog um, I've programmed in about 15 different programming languages and when I hit Verilog it was just like crikey this is very old looking <laughs> uh, it was very limited and then I realized what I was reading was a text based on Verilog 1995 I subsequently realized there was a Verilog 2001 etc so this is a very modern implementation uh, that makes writing Verilog a lot better than it was I'm not going to say that Verilog is particularly nice or the same, but it, it, the modern implementation is a lot better. It also includes some nice functions in there, recognition of things like memory, etc., just to make things a bit more simple. Um, he's also got checking, monitoring, synthesis, and he's also got timing tools as well. Not all of those are complete at this point, um, but they're coming on pretty fast. But parallel is generally hard. You know, whether you're using CUDA, CL, MPI on a, a Newman type architecture, whether you're trying to use Verilog, 
what we really need is higher level abstractions um, that are easier to program with. Uh, and I think these are going to turn out to be, if you like, kind of Turing primitives that are going to be regurgitated and combined in ways. It's a bit like writing in maths, if you like, rather than just plain algorithms, but it's matrix math. Um, and finding ways of expressing things such as convolutions and neural networks, perceptrons, fast Fourier transforms and these things, to bring these into some kind of lingua franca that will help us describe these more complex type issues when it comes to things like machine learning, recognition, pattern recognition, those kinds of things. Um, so one of the things that I'm looking at is something called matrixed open Turing engines. It would be nice to be able to build a subset of these things that can then be recombined to actually make those basic things. Because what you will probably see is a load of proprietary runs emerging over the next five to ten years. Uh, and I think we need to make sure that there's a good open um, Linga Franca, if you like, for describing these things that will happen at a, low, uh, at a higher level. Um, there's a bit more detail about it, the front ends and back ends that Yosis supports. I won't go too much into that. How am I doing for time? So, um, have a go if you, if you already know Verilog or if you want to learn Verilog or want to get into FPGAs. Um, and you're using Linux or Mac OS, then take a look at Yosis. Um, it really is quite simple to use. You can target these, or even new silicon that we see emerging soon, which is going to help me and my friends get even further. Questions?